Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Brigham Talbot It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that, long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabel Lee so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Buttons by Carl Sandburg. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. I have been watching the war map slammed up for advertising in front of the newspaper office. Buttons, red and yellow buttons, blue and black buttons are shoved back and forth across the map. A laughing young man, sunny with freckles, climbs a ladder, yells a joke to somebody in the crowd, and then fixes a yellow button one inch west, and follows the yellow button with a black button one inch west. Ten thousand men and boys twist on their bodies in a red soak along a river edge, gasping of wounds, calling for water, some rattling death in their throats. Who would guess what it cost to move two buttons one inch on the war map here in front of the newspaper office where the freckle-faced young man is laughing to us? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Drawn for Valentine by the LDS by Thomas Stanley Read for LibriVox.org by Public Domain Scholar Drawn for Valentine by the LDS Though against me love and destiny conspire, Though I must waste in an unpitied fire, By the same deity, severe as fair, Commanded adoration and despair, Though I am marked for sacrifice, To tell the growing age what dangerous glories dwell, In this bright dawn, who, when she spreads her rays, will challenge every heart and every praise. Yet she who to all hope forbids my claim, by fortune's taunt, indulgence to my flame, great queen of chance, unjustly we exclude thy power and interest in beatitude, who with mysterious judgment doth dispense the bounties of unerring providence, whilst we to whom the causes are unknown would style that blindness thine which is our own, as kind injustice to thyself as me, 
thou hast redeemed thy name and votary, nor will I prize this less for being thine, no longer at my destiny repine. Counsel and choice are things below thy state. Fortune relieves the cruelties of fate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Easter Day by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Salisbury The silver trumpets rang across the dome, the people knelt upon the ground with awe, and borne upon the necks of men I saw, like some great god, the holy lord of Rome. Priest-like, he wore a robe more white than foam, and king-like, swathed himself in royal red. Three crowns of gold rose high upon his head, in splendour and in light the Pope passed home. My heart stole back across wide wastes of years to one who wandered by a lonely sea and sought in vain for any place of rest. Foxes have holes and every bird its nest. I, only I, must wander wearily and bruise my feet and drink wine salt with tears. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Enchanted Castle by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org By Fenman To Edgar Allan Poe Old crumbling stones set long ago Upon the naked headland of a suave green shore Old stones all riven into cracks and glands By moss and ivy Up above a peak of narrow iron windows, a hooded tower with frozen windows looking to the west. When the sun sets, a winking fiery light riffles the window panes above the gloom of purple waters heaving evenly, waters moving about the naked headland in sombre slowness with no dash of spray to strike the stagnant pools and flash the weeds. A rack of shifting clouds darkens the water's margin. On the shore are clusters of great trees, whose brittle leaves crackle together as the mournful wind takes them and shakes them but the tower windows fling bloody streams of light across the dusk, flanges of bloody light which the upper sky has hurled at them and now is drawing back. Behind the tower, where no windows are, a little wisp of moon catches the stones so that they glitter palely from the shore, the suave green shore, with all its leaden trees. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Faith's Vista by Henry Abbey. Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Randall. When from the vaulted wonder of the sky, the curtain of the light is drawn aside, and I behold the stars in all their wide significance and glorious mystery, assured that those more distant orbs are suns round which innumerable worlds revolve. My faith grows strong, my day-born doubts dissolve, and death, that dread annulment which life shuns, or fain would shun, becomes to life the way, the thoroughfare to greater worlds on high, the bridge from star to star. Seek how we may, there is no other road across the sky. And, looking up, I hear star voices say, You could not reach us if you did not die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Filiae by Marie Emily Gilchrist. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. 
daughterly love like dower linen spun and woven long ago uncut lengths from her grandmother's loom creamed with age and rough with tow folded away in her homely heart it lay unworn and unbestowed it had no use while her father lived it could not even be his shroud end of poem this recording is in the public domain God's Acre by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I like that ancient Saxon phrase which calls the burial ground God's Acre, it is just. It consecrates each grave within its walls and breathes a venison o'er the sleeping dust. God's Acre, yes, that blessed name imparts comfort to those who in the grave have sown the seed that they had garnered in their hearts, their bread of life, alas, no more their own. Into its furrows shall we all be cast, in the sure faith that we shall rise again at the great harvest, when the archangel's blast shall winnow like a fan the chaff and grain. Then shall the good stand in immortal bloom in the fair gardens of that second birth and each bright blossom mingle its perfume with that of flowers which never bloomed on earth with thy rude ploughshare death turn up the sod and spread the furrow for the seed we sow this is the field and acre of our god this is the place where human harvests grow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Good Company by Charles Wilson Baker Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. Today I have grown taller from walking with the trees, the seven sister poplars who go softly in a line. And I think my heart is whiter, for its parley with a star that trembled out at nightfall and hung above the pine. The call note of a redbird from the cedars in the dusk woke his happy mate within me to an answer free and fine. And a sudden angel beckoned from a column of blue smoke. Lord, who am I that they should stoop, these holy folk of thine? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Graves by Carl Sandburg, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. I dreamed one man stood against a thousand, one man damned as a wrong-headed fool. One year and another he walked the streets, and a thousand shrugs and hoots met him in the shoulders and mouths he passed. He died alone, and only the undertaker came to his funeral. Flowers grow over his grave, a nod in the wind, and over the graves of the thousand too, the flowers grow a nod in the wind. Flowers and the wind, flowers a nod over the graves of the dead, petals of red, Leaves of yellow, streaks of white, masses of purple sagging. I love you and your great way of forgetting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Greek by Oscar Wilde. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Salisbury. Sweet, I blame you not for mine, the fault was, had I not been made of common clay. I had climbed the higher heights and climbed yet, seen the fuller air, the larger day. From the wildness of my wasted passion, I had struck a better, clearer song, lit some lighter light of freer freedom, battled with some hydra-headed wrong. Had my lips been smitten into music by the kisses that but made them bleed, you had walked with Bice and the angels on that verdant and enamelled mead. I had trod the road which Dante treading saw the suns of seven circles shine. 
I perchance had seen the heavens opening as they opened to the Florentine, and the mighty nations would have crowned me, who I am crownless now and without name, as an orient dawn had found me kneeling on the threshold of the house of fame. I had sat within that marble circle where the oldest bard is as the young, and the pipe is ever dropping honey, and the lyre's strings are ever strung. Keats had lifted up his hymenal curls from out the poppy-seeded wine. With ambrosial mouth had kissed my forehead, clasped the hands of noble love in mine. And at the springtide, when the apple blossoms brushed the burnished bosom of the dove, two young lovers lying in an orchard would have read the story of our love, would have read the legend of my passion, known the bitter secret of my heart, kissed as we have kissed, but never parted as we two are fated now to part. For the crimson flower of our life is eaten by the canker worm of truth, and no hand can gather up the fallen withered petals of the rose of youth. Yet I am not sorry that I loved you. Ah, what else had I a boy to do? For the hungry teeth of time devour and the silent-footed years pursue. Rudderless we drift athwart a tempest, and when once the storm of youth is past, without lyre, without lute or chorus, death, the silent pilot, comes at last, and within the grave there is no pleasure for the blind worm battens of the root, and desire shudders into ashes, and the tree of passion burns no fruit. Ah, what else had I to do but love you? God's own mother was less dear to me, and less dear the Cytherean rising like an argent lily from the sea. I have made my choice, have lived my poems, and though youth is gone in wasted days, I have found the lover's crown of myrtle better than the poet crown of days. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Human Seasons by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. Four seasons fill the measure of the year. There are four seasons in the mind of man. He has his lusty spring, when fancy clear takes in all beauty with an easy span. He has his summer, when luxuriously springs honeyed cud of youthful thought he loves to ruminate, and by such dreaming high is nearest unto heaven. Quiet coves. His soul has in its autumn, when his wings he furleth close, contented, so to look on mists and idleness, to let fair things pass by, unheeded, as a threshold brook. He has his winter, too, of pale misfeature, or else he would forego his mortal nature. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hummingbird by Beatrice Ravenel Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The sundial makes no sign at the point of the August noon. The sky is of ancient tin, and the ring of the mountains diffused and unmade one always remembers them. On the twisted dark of the hemlock hedge rain like a line of shivering violin bows hissing together, poised on the last turgescent swell, batters the flowers. Under the trumpet vine ardor, clear, precise as an Ottoman print, the air is of melted glass, solid, filling interstices of leaves that are spaced on the spines like a pattern ground into glass. Dead as though dull red glass were poured into the mouth, choking the breath, molding itself into the creases of soft red tissues. And a hummingbird darts head first, splitting the air, keen as a spurt of fire shot from the blowpipe, cracking a star of rays. Dives like a flash of fire, forked tail lancing the air into the immobile trumpet. Stands on the air, wings like a triple shadow whizzing about him. Shadows thrown on the midnight streets by a snow-flecked arc light. Shadows like sword play. Splinters and spines from a thousand dreams whiz from his wings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If Love Could Last by Alfred Austin 
Read for LibriVox.org by Ron Altman If love could last, if love could last, The future be as was the past, Nor faith and fondness ever know the chill Of dwindling afterglow, Oh, then we should not have to long For cuckoo's call and throstle's song, but every season then would ring with rapturous voices of the spring. In budding brake and grassy glade the primrose then would never fade, the windflower flag, the bluebell haze faint from the winding woodland ways, but vernal hopes chase wintry fears, and happy smiles and happier tears be like the sun and clouds at play, if love could last. If love could last, the rose would then not bloom but once to fade again. June to the lily would not give a life less fair than fugitive, but flower and leaf and lawn renew their freshness nightly with the dew. In forest dingles dim and deep, where curtained noonday lies asleep, the faithful ring-dove ne'er would cease its anthem of abiding peace. All the year round we then should stray through fragrance of the new-mown hay or sit and ponder old-world rhymes under the leaves of scented limes. Careless of time, we should not fear the footsteps of the fleeting year, or, did the long warm days depart, t'would still be summer in our heart, did love but last. Did love but last, no shade of grief for fading flower, for falling leaf, for stubbles whence the piled-up wain hath borne away the golden grain, leaving a load of loss behind, would shock the heart and haunt the mind. With mellow gaze we then should see the ripe fruit shaken from the tree, the swallow's troop the acorns fall, the last peach redden on the wall, the osthouse smoke, the hopbine burn, knowing that all good things return to love that lasts. If love could last, who then would mind the freezing rack, the unfeeling wind, the curdling pool, the shivering sedge, the empty nest and leafless hedge, brown dripping bents and furrows bare, the wild geese clamoring through the air, the huddling kine, the sodden leaves, lacklustre dawns and clammy eaves. For then, through twilight days morose, we should within keep warm and close, and by the friendly fireside blaze talk of the ever-sacred days when first we met, and felt how drear were life without the other near. Or, too at peace with bliss to speak, sit hand in hand and cheek to cheek, if love could last. Yet love can last, Yes, love can last, the future be as was the past, and faith and fondness never know the chill of dwindling afterglow. If to familiar hearth there cling the virgin freshness of the spring, and April's music still be heard in wooing voice and winning word, if when autumnal shadows streak the furrowed brow, the wrinkled cheek, devotion deepening to the close, like fruit that ripens, tenderer grows. If, though the leaves of youth and hope lie thick on life's declining slope, the fond heart faithful to the last, 
lingers in love drifts of the past. If, with the gravely shortening days, faith trims the lamp, faith feeds the blaze, and reverence, robed in wintry white, sheds fragrance like a summer night, then love can last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In a Rose Garden by John Bennett Read for LibriVox.org by Ron Altman A hundred years from now, dear heart, We will not care at all, It will not matter then a whit, The honey or the gall, the summer days that we have known will all forgotten be and flown. The garden will be overgrown where now the roses fall. A hundred years from now, dear heart, we will not mind the pain. The throbbing crimson tide of life will not have left a stain. The song we sing together, dear, the dream we dream together here, will mean no more than means a tear amid a summer rain. A hundred years from now, dear heart, the grief will all be o'er, the sea of care will surge in vain upon a careless shore. These glasses we turn down to-day, here at the parting of the way, we will be wineless then as they, and will not mind it more. A hundred years from now, dear heart, we'll neither know nor care what came of all life's bitterness or followed love's despair. Then fill the glasses up again and kiss me through the rose-leaf rain. We'll build one castle more in Spain and dream one more dream there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Excelsis by Amy Lowell, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Shirey. You, you, your shadow is sunlight on a plate of silver, your footsteps the seeding place of lilies. Your hands moving, a chime of bells across a windless air. The movement of your hands is the long, golden running of light from a rising sun. It is the hopping of birds upon a garden path. As the perfume of jonquils, you come forth in the morning. Young horses are not more sudden than your thoughts. Your words are bees about a pear tree. Your fancies are the gold and black striped wasps buzzing among red apples. I drink your lips. I eat the whiteness of your hands and feet. My mouth is open. As a new jar, I am empty and open. Like white water are you who fill the cup of my mouth. Like a brook of water thronged with lilies. You are frozen as the clouds. You are far and sweet as the high clouds. I dare reach to you. I dare touch the rim of your brightness. I leap beyond the winds. I cry and shout, for my throat is keen as a sword sharpened on a hone of ivory. My throat sings the joy of my eyes, the rushing gladness of my love. How has the rainbow fallen upon my heart? How have I snared the seas to lie in my fingers and caught the sky to be a cover for my head? How have you come to dwell with me, compassing me with the four circles of your mystic lightness, so that I say glory, glory, and bow before you as to a shrine? Do I tease myself that morning is morning and a day after? Do I think the air a condescension, the earth a politeness, 
heaven a boon deserving thanks? So you, air, earth, heaven, I do not thank you. I take you. I live. And those things which I say in consequent are rubies mortized in a gate of stone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Italia by Oscar Wilde, read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Salisbury. Italia, thou art fallen, though with sheen, of battle spears thy clamorous army stride, from the north alps of the Sicilian tide. I, fallen though the nation's health be queen, because rich gold in every town is seen, and on thy sapphire lake, in tossing pride, of wind-filled vans thy myriad galleys ride, beneath one flag of red and white and green, O fair and strong, O strong and fair in vain, look southward where Rome's desecrated town lies mourning for her God-anointed king. Look heavenward, shall God allow this thing? Nay, but some flame-girt Raphael shall come down and smite the spoiler with the sword of pain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Je ne sais quoi by William Whitehead, read for LibriVox.org, by Roger Smith. The je ne sais quoi. Yes, I'm in love, I feel it now, and Celia has undone me. And yet, I'll swear I can't tell how, the pleasing plague stole on me. Tis not her face that love creates, for there no graces revel. Tis not her shape, for there the fates have rather been uncivil. Tis not her air, for sure in that, there's nothing more than common, and all her sense is only chat like any other woman. Her voice, her touch, might give it the alarm, t'was both perhaps or neither, and short, t'was that provoking charm of Celia altogether. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Judgment by Marie Emily Gilchrist, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Her body she kept undefiled, her mind bore many a bastard child to his opinion. Bad or good, each thought betrayed his parenthood. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Junk Man by Carl Sandburg, read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. I am glad God saw death and gave death a job taking care of all who are tired of living. When all the wheels in a clock are worn and slow and the connections loose, and the clock goes on ticking and telling the wrong time from hour to hour. And people around the house joke about what a bum clock it is. How glad the clock is when the big junk man drives his wagon up to the house and puts his arms around the clock and says, You don't belong here. You gotta come along with me. How glad the clock is then when it feels the arms of the junk man close around it and carry it away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lake Dweller by Carl Young Rice Read for LibriVox.org by Fenman I've never climbed mountains, nor sailed across the sea. I don't know where Lasser is, nor Seoul, nor Araby. But every year the wild geese, with distance on their wings, come dropping into Dual Lake and tell me many things. They don't speak in Latin, and Greek is not their tongue. Their lore is not in any book. It can't be said or sung. 
but when i see them sink down from star expectant skies i learn what would even make the fool's heart wise they've been where i'll never go they'll go as far again yet though i'm but a man it is their wings alone i can so i can see at dual lake more than worlds go by in just a flock of wild geese that pass along the sky end of poem this recording is in the public domain let it go thee by e e cummings read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp let it go the smashed word broken open vow or the oath cracked lengthwise let it go it was sworn to go let them go the truthful liars and the false fair friends and the boaths and the neithers you must let them go they were born to go let all go the big small middling tall bigger really the biggest in all things let all go dear so comes love and a poem this recording is in the public domain lilacs by amy lowell read for LibriVox.org by anna shirey lilacs false blue white purple color of lilac your great puffs of flowers are everywhere in this my new england among your heart-shaped leaves orange orioles hop like music box birds and sing their little weak soft songs in the crooks of your branches the bright eyes of song sparrows sitting on spotted eggs peer restlessly through the light and shadow of all springs lilacs in dooryards holding quiet conversations with an early moon lilacs watching a deserted house settling sideways into the grass of an old road lilacs wind-beaten staggering under a lopsided shock of bloom above a cellar dug into a hill you are everywhere you were everywhere you tapped the window when the preacher preached his sermon and ran along the road beside the boy going to school you stood by pasture bars to give the cows good milking you persuaded the housewife that her dishpan was of silver and her husband an image of pure gold you flaunted the fragrance of your blossoms through the wide doors of custom houses you and sandalwood and tea charging the noses of quill driving clerks when a ship was in from china you called to them goose quill men goose quill men may is a month for flitting until they writhed on their high stools and wrote poetry on their letter sheets behind the propped up ledgers paradoxical new england clerks writing inventories and ledgers reading the song of solomon at night so many verses before bedtime because it was the bible the dead fed you amid the slant stones of graveyards pale ghosts who planted you came in the night time and let their thin hair blow through your clustered stems you are of the green sea and of the stone hills which reach a long distance you are of elm-shaded streets with little shops where they sell kites and marbles you are of great parks where every one walks and nobody is at home you cover the blind sides of greenhouses and lean over the top to say a hurry word through the glass to your friends the grapes inside lilacs false blue white purple color of lilac you have forgotten your eastern origin the veiled women with eyes like panthers the swollen aggressive turbans of jeweled pashas now you are a very decent flower a reticent flower a curiously clear-cut 
candid flower, standing beside clean doorways, friendly to a house cat and a pair of spectacles, making poetry out of a bit of moonlight and a hundred or two sharp blossoms. Maine knows you, has for years and years. New Hampshire knows you, and Massachusetts and Vermont. Cape Cod starts you along the beaches to Rhode Island. Connecticut takes you from a river to the sea. You are brighter than apples, sweeter than tulips. You are the great flood of our souls, bursting above the leaf shapes of our hearts. You are the smell of all summers, the love of wives and children, the recollection of the gardens of little children. You are state houses and charters, and the familiar treading of the foot to and fro on a road it knows. May is lilac here in New England. May is a thrush singing sun up on a tip-top ash tree. May is white clouds behind pine trees, puffed out and marching upon a blue sky. May is a green as no other. May is much sun through small leaves. May is soft earth and apple blossoms, and windows open to a south wind. May is a full light wind of lilac, from Canada to Narragansett Bay. Lilacs, false blue, white, purple, color of lilac, heart leaves of lilac all over New England, roots of lilac under all the soil of New England, lilac in me because I am New England, because my roots are in it, because my leaves are of it, because my flowers are for it, because it is my country, and I speak to it of itself, and sing of it with my own voice, since certainly it is mine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Little Ghost by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Ron Altman The Little Ghost I knew her for a little ghost that in my garden walked. The wall is high, higher than most, and the green gate was locked. And yet I did not think of that till after she was gone. I knew her by the broad white hat, all ruffled she had on, by the dear ruffles round her feet, by her small hands that hung in their lace mitts, austere and sweet, her gown's white folds among. I watched to see if she would stay, what she would do, and, oh, she looked as if she liked the way I let my garden grow. She bent above my favorite mint with conscious garden grace. She smiled and smiled. There was no hint of sadness in her face. She held her gown on either side to let her slippers show, and up the walk she went with pride, the way great ladies go. And where the wall is built in new and is of ivy bare, she paused then opened and passed through a gate that once was there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love's Growth by John Donne Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I scarce believe my love to be so pure as I had thought it was, because it doth endure vicissitude and season as the grass. Methinks I lied all winter when I swore my love was infinite, if spring make it more. But if this medicine, love, which cures all sorrow with more, not only be no quintessence, but mixed of all stuffs, paining soul or sense, and of the sun his working vigor borrow, love's not so pure and abstract as they used to say, which have no mistress but their muse, but as all else being elemented too, love sometimes would contemplate, 
sometimes do. And yet no greater but more eminent love by the spring is grown, as in the firmament stars by the sun are not enlarged but shown. Gentle love deeds as blossoms on a bough, from love's awakened root do bud out now. If, as in water stirred, more circles be produced by one, love such additions take, those like so many spheres but one heaven make, for they are all concentric unto thee. And though each spring do add to love new heat, as princes do in times of action get new taxes and remit them not in peace, no winter shall abate the spring's increase. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. May by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Seacam The wind is tossing the lilacs The new leaves laugh in the sun And the petals fall on the orchard wall But for me, the spring is done Beneath the apple blossoms I go a wintry way for love that smiled in April is false to me in May. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our God, Our Help in Ages Past by Isaac Watts Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its suns away. They fly forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our God while troubles last, and our eternal home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Pleasant Ship by Unknown Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee I saw a ship a-sailing, a-sailing on the sea, And, oh, it was all laden with pretty things for thee. There were comfits in the cabin, and apples in the hold. The sails were made of silk, and the masts were made of gold. The four-and-twenty sailors that stood between the decks were four-and-twenty white mice with chains about their necks. The captain was a duck with a packet on his back, and when the ship began to move, the captain said quack quack and of poem this recording is in the public domain prayer and answer by oliver huckle read for librivox dot org by larry wilson o oh god i cannot walk the way the thorns the thirst the darkness and bleeding feet and aching heart i hear the songs and revels of the throng they sneer upon my downcast face with scorn yet o oh my god i must and shall walk with thee o oh god i cannot take the truth far easier honeyed hopes and falsehoods fair but truth the truth is stern and strong and awful. 
it ploughs my soul with ploughshares flaming hot yet give me truth i must have truth o god o god i cannot live the life the flinging all to death that life may come the surging of thy spirit in my heart in fire and flame will all consume me yet o oh my god i cannot live without thee and as i agonized in dust and shame with tears and sighs in all the bitter prayer i felt as twere an arm that stole around me and raised me to my feet and at the touch hope blossomed in my heart and new-found strength in flood-tides thrilled and throbbed through soul and limbs i looked to see o oh, tender lordly face it was himself the way the truth the life End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. La Ronde du Diable by Amy Lowell. Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Shirey. Here we go round the ivy bush, and that's a tune we all dance to. Little poet people snatching ivy, trying to prevent one another from snatching ivy. If you get a leaf, there's another for me. Look at the bush. But I want your leaf, brother, and you mine. Therefore, of course, we push. Here we go round the laurel tree. But do we want laurels for ourselves most, or most that no one else shall have any? We cannot stop to discuss the question. We cannot stop to plate them into crowns, or notice whether they become us. We scarcely see the laurel tree. The crowd about us is all we see, and there's no room in it for you and me. Therefore, sisters, it's my belief, we've none of us very much chance at a leaf. Here we go round the barberry bush. It's a bitter blood-red fruit at best, which puckers the mouth and burns the heart. To tell the truth, only one or two want the berries, enough to strive for more than he has, more than she an acid berry for you and me, abundance of berries for all who will eat, but an aching meat. That's poetry. Who wants to swallow a mouthful of sorrow? The world is old, and our century must be well along, and we've no time to waste. Make haste, brothers, and sisters push with might and main round the ivy bush. Struggle and pull at the laurel tree, and leave the barberries be for poor lost lunatics like me who set them so high they overtop the sun in the sky does it matter at all that we don't know why end of poem this recording is in the public domain a rose to the living by Nixon Waterman Read for LibriVox.org By Ike Scher A rose to the living Is more than sumptuous wreaths to the dead. In filling love's infinite store, A rose to the living Is more. If graciously given, Before the hungering spirit is fled, A rose to the living Is more than sumptuous wreaths To the dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sands of D by Charles Kingsley. Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman. O oh Mary, go and call the cattle home, and call the cattle home. And call the cattle home across the sands of D. The western wind was wild and dank with foam, and all alone went she. The western tide crept up along the sand, and o'er and o'er the sand, and round and round the sand, as far as the eye could see. The rolling mist came down and hid the land and never home she came. Oh, 
Is it weed or fish or floating hair? A tress of golden hair, a drowned maiden's hair, above the nets at sea, was never salmon yet that shone so fair among the stakes on D. They rowed her in across the rolling foam, the cruel crawling foam, the cruel hungry foam, to her grave beside the sea. But still the boatman heard her call the cattle home across the sands of D. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Small Towns by Marie Emily Gilchrist. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. The peace that rests upon you is in the wanderer's eyes, who sees wide fields and patriarch trees, and clustered homes in the midst of these, blue smoke upcurled from a warm hearth fire, and the slender gleam of a white church spire. He sees you from afar in tranquil guise. The life that burns within you is far removed from peace. A handful of people suffer and toil, grown too close in a bit of soil, and knotted together like roots of trees, the blind and struggling souls of these find neither sustenance nor winged release. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring in Winter by Gerald Bullitt Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee My memories of you are singing birds In the green forest of my mind Where I may roam, recapturing your whispered words Or on a bank of glowing bluebells fly Listening forever, spring is come again in all her glory the erst withered trees that creep like living skeletons in pain defying the wind have donned green garments these new shoots these blossoms and these buds the springing grass and the sky where many colors blend my songsters by the magic of their singing have in a moment made my thoughts of you are music which to all my spirits rue is the ineffable answer and the end end of poem this recording is in the public domain storm fear by robert frost read for librivox dot org by m when the wind works against us in the dark and pelts with snow the lower chamber window on the east and whispers with a sort of stifled bark the beast come out come out it costs no inward struggle not to go ah no i count our strength two and a child those of us not asleep subdued to mark how the cold creeps as the fire dies at length how drifts are piled dooryard and road ungraded till even the comforting barn grows far away and my heart owns a doubt whether tis in us to arise with day and save ourselves unaided end of poem this recording is in the public domain St. Valentine's Day by Henry King Read for LibriVox.org by Public Domain Scholar St. Valentine's Day Now that each feathered chorister doth sing The glad approaches of the welcome spring Now Phoebus starts forth his more early beam And tips it later in the curled stream I should to custom prove a retrograde Did I still dote upon my sullen shade Oft half the seasons finished and begun 
days into months, those into years, have run, since my cross stars and then auspicious fate doom me to linger here without my mate, whose loss e'er since befrost in my desire, left me an altar without gift or fire. I therefore could have wished, for your own sake, that fortune hath designed a nobler stake for you to draw than one whose fading day like to a dedicated taper lay within a tomb and long burnt out in vain since nothing there saw better by the flame yet since you like your chance i must not try to mar it through my incapacity i here make title to it and proclaim how much you honour me to wear my name who can no form of gratitude devise but offer of myself your sacrifice hail then my worthy lot and may each morn successive springs of joy to you be born may your content ne'er wane until my heart grown bankrupt wants good wishes to impart henceforth i need not make the dust my shrine nor search the grave for my lost valentine end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Swamp by Crystal Hastings Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman Night settles swiftly with its ghostly tread Over the tangled swamp where trees lie dead Their stumps upright like lonely shapes of men Long lost in wet morass and shadowed glen a silence broods over the sodden aisles of lifelessness that stretch for aching miles beyond a moor where clouds hang gray and cold sinister roofing for a pond grown old night gropes with ease about the stealthy weed that sucks its life a tawny wind-blown reed from sodden flooring where mosquitoes hum their high soprano to the frog's shrill drum and of poem this recording is in the public domain to baffle time by henry abbey read for LibriVox.org by patrick randall to baffle time whose tooth has never rest and make the counted line from page to page compact fulfilled of what is apt and best and vibrant with the keynote of the age this is my aim and even aims are things they give men value who have won no place we pass for what we would be by some grace and our ambitions make us seem like kings but never yet has destiny's clear star for aimless feet shed light upon the way so have i hope since purpose sees no bar to write immortally some lyric day as lovelace did when he informed the lay inspired by his lucasta and by war End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To My Wife by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Smith To My Wife I can write no stately poem as a prelude to my lay From a point to a poem I would dare to say for if of these fallen petals one to you seem fair, love will waft it till it settles on your hair. And when wind and winter harden all the loveless land, it will whisper of the garden you will understand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Twenty four Hoku on a modern theme by amy lowell read for librivox dot org by fenman again the larkspur heavenly blue in my garden 
they at least unchanged how have i hurt you you look at me with pale eyes but these are my tears morning and evening yet for us once long ago was no division i hear many words set an hour when i may come or remain silent in the ghostly dawn i write new words for your ears even now you sleep this then is morning have you no comfort for me cold coloured flowers my eyes are weary following you everywhere short o oh short the days when the flower falls the leaf is no more cherished every day i fear even when you smile sorrow is behind your eyes pity me therefore laugh it is nothing to others you may seem gay i watch with grieved eyes take it this white rose stems of roses do not bleed your fingers are safe as a river wind hurling clouds at a bright moon so am i to you watching the iris the faint and fragile petals how am i worthy down a red river i drift in a broken skiff are you then so brave night lies beside me chaste and cold as a sharp sword it and i alone last night it rained now in the desolate dawn crying of blue jays foolish so to grieve autumn has its coloured leaves but before they turn afterwards i think poppies bloom when it thunders is this not enough love is a game yes i think it is a drowning black willows and stars when the aster fades the creeper flaunts in crimson always another turning from the page blind with a night of labour i hear morning crows a cloud of lilies or else you walk before me who could see clearly sweet smell of wet flowers over an evening garden your portrait perhaps staying in my room i thought of the new spring leaves that day was happy end of poem this recording is in the public domain twilight at sea by amelia welby read for LibriVox.org by roger smith twilight at sea the twilight hours like birds fly by as lightly and as free ten thousand stars were in the sky ten thousand on the sea for every wave with dimpled face that leapt upon the air had caught a star in its embrace and held it trembling there end of poem this recording is in the public domain what do we plant by henry abbey read for LibriVox.org by patrick randall what do we plant when we plant the tree we plant the ship which will cross the sea we plant the mast to carry the sails we plant the planks to withstand the gales the keel the keelson 
and beam and knee, we plant the ship when we plant the tree. What do we plant when we plant the tree? We plant the houses for you and me. We plant the rafters, the shingles, the floors. We plant the studding, the lath, the doors, the beams and siding, all parts that be. We plant the house when we plant the tree. What do we plant when we plant the tree? A thousand things that we daily see. We plant the spire that outtowers the crag. We plant the staff for our country's flag. We plant the shade from the hot sun free. We plant all these when we plant the tree. February 1890 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.